Please open your Bibles to Proverbs 31. Our lesson will be from that particular passage tonight. Seems that uh, women are very much in the news these days, leading marches in order to demonstrate their political power, their political influence, standing up to and denouncing predators and abusers. Seems that every single day a new name pops up championing the rights of women to compete fairly in every area of business and politics, sports, entertainment. On the face of it, it would be hard to find fault with any of these in individual initiatives and objectives. I mean, who could, who, who could argue against these things? A women's vote should be considered crucial by politicians, of course. And women should be judged on their skills and on their training and not on their gender when it comes to employment and opportunity for advancement in any area of endeavor. Who would argue against that? And we, as a society, should never enable or ignore or defend predators or abusers, no matter how rich they are, no matter how famous they are, they should be denounced. They should be punished. So all these issues, you know, they're all logical and just. But you know me, <laughs> I just can't help but think that the ultimate goal of these and other movements headed up by women, some women, that the end game is to erase any difference there may exist between the sexes. I think that's one of the objectives of these things. And I would go one step further and suggest that there may be some that are hoping that the women's movement will ultimately lead to a society where women dominate men. I have no idea of exactly how this would work, but I'm fairly confident that it, uh, if dominance is the goal, then women uh, will eventually be guilty of the same kind of cruel and unjust actions that abusive men have made who sought the same kind of power. Whoever, whoever has the goal of dominating usually does not have justice and fairness in mind. <laughs> because the goal of domination doesn't bode well with the goal of justice and fairness. Whether that be women, searching for dominance or men searching for dominance. In today's society, it seems that men are encouraged to become more like women. And women are demanding to be treated more like men. In addition to this, young people are told that they can explore every shade of gender identity until they find a sexual personification that they feel comfortable with. Imagine. And we wonder why, according to psychology today, that the suicide rate among young adults, that's millennials, has tripled since 1950. Tripled. And the suicide is the second most cause of death among college students. We wonder why this is so. In answer to this worrying trend and confusion over what is male and what is female, the Bible makes a clear and defining statement. Genesis 1:27. God created man in his own image, male and female, he created them. There are only two sexes. They are different and they are meant to be different. As the French say concerning men and women, vive la différence. In English it's long live the difference. And wise is the individual that understands the difference. Since I began this lesson referring mainly to women, I'd like to focus on the female gender in defining some of the important characteristics that define not just a woman, 
but that defines a godly woman. You see, there's nothing wrong with a woman who desires political and economic opportunity. And nothing wrong, of course, with a woman who refuses to be victimized by some abuser. These are well and good. It's just that these goals belong to the world. And they're appreciated here in the world. What I desire for women is that they aim higher for goals that are above, for goals that belong to the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of darkness here below. For this reason, I'd like to share with you the portrait of an ideal woman designed by God and revealed some 3,000 years ago in Solomon's book of Proverbs. In this passage, the writer indicates some of the qualities possessed by the ideal woman who is pleasing to God. Whether she has political success or not is not in the equation. And so we go to chapter 31, the description of an ideal woman. We find this passage at the end of Proverbs, this beautiful acrostic poem extolling the virtues of the ideal woman. Acrostic poems are those with each line of poetry beginning with the subsequent letter of the alphabet. So if we were writing an acrostic poem in English, the first line would begin with the letter A, and then the first word in the second line would begin with the letter B, and then the third line, you know, the first word would begin with the letter C, and so on and so forth. That's an acrostic poem. In this poem, the writer begins his description by saying one thing about the virtuous woman. He says, she is rare. First, first thing he says, she is rare. Read with me, 31 verse 10. He says, a wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. And so basically he's saying, not every woman is like this. Just like not every piece of jewelry is precious. Pearls are precious because they are rare and they're hard to find. And we know that all jewelry shines, but not all jewelry is valuable. In the same way, he says, a virtuous woman, a woman who has inner strength, is hard to find. Even harder to find, he says, than precious jewels. So he answers this question, what makes her so valuable? in verses 11 and 12. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. So the writer summarizes her value in describing her relationship to her husband. She is trustworthy, he says. He tells us that the innate quality that this woman possesses is her trustworthiness, not just to her husband, but as an essential quality that she has as a person, with or without a husband. She is trustworthy. And though he goes on to say, when you have found a woman like this, he says, you have found a precious stone. Now in the following verses, the author goes on to describe the outward signs that reveal that precious inward quality of her trustworthiness. You cannot look at a person, you cannot look at a woman and just by looking at her see trustworthiness. That's an inside thing. And so the author describes the outside things that point to the inside things. First of all, he says, she's a good manager and a hard worker. This points to her trustworthiness. Verse 13, he says, she selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. 
In her hand she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. A long passage describing several of her actions. And he gives, by doing this, examples of her hard work and good management. For example, in verse 13, she's cheerful, he says, in her work. She doesn't complain or see her work as burdensome. Verse 14, she uses imagination, he says, in preparing food and is a wise shopper, careful with her money. Verse 15, she manages her responsibilities well in her home. In other words, she's on top of the situation concerning her affairs. Verse 16 to 24, he says she has good business sense and he know, she knows how to turn a profit Without sacrificing her home, she's able to use her business talents to the advantage of her home. In other words, she doesn't ruin her home with outside work, she builds up her home with her outside work. Verse 17 to 19, she is not afraid, he says, of hard work and does not waste her time at home. This is a woman who knows the difference between leisure and laziness. She demonstrates that a well-managed home is a profitable enterprise. She understands that time is money, even for the woman who is at home and uses her time at home profitably. I've always said to our children, a well-managed home is like a second income. In verses 21 to 23, by her work at home, the writer says that she contributes to her families and to her husband's reputation in the community. Her children are clean, well-fed, and mannered, as is her husband, and this is a reflection of their home of which she is the manager. And so, if marriage is a partnership, the woman that the author describes here is a very good partner to have. So in describing the outward signs that point to the inward quality of the ideal woman, the author begins by describing the things that makes her a good manager and a hard worker. Other outward signs of inward quality that the writer manages to say, he says she has a good character and a good reputation. Verses 25 to 27, strength and dignity are her clothing and she smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. And so the second outward sign that reveals this trustworthiness is her good character and her reputation with her community. And he says four things about her character. Number one in verse 25, she's kind and generous. James tells us in his book that benevolence to the poor and homeless is the sign of true piety. James chapter one verse 27. And so this is a truly spiritual woman with a godly character and she has confidence She's not afraid of the future, the near future or the far future, because her faith and her good works cover her with honor and power. She is a person who is at ease in her conscience because her heart and her hands are busy doing what is right. She is not guilt-ridden or depressed because she is busy giving herself away to others, others that she loves. In verse 26, he says that she's wise. Her tongue is not for gossip, but rather for edification. You know, this is one of my own mother's qualities. Uh, she is long gone now, but when I think back about my mother, she had many good qualities, but the one that I admired the most in her 
was her ability never to say a bad word about anyone, even someone that was actually deserving to be brought down because they had done something to my mother which was nasty or unkind. I couldn't even provoke her to say anything bad about them. She was always making, not excuses, but making allowances for other people's weaknesses. It was a beautiful quality that she had and, and one that I struggled with myself but thankfully one that I find in my own wife as well. Both of them never use their words to destroy, always to build others up, beginning with myself, of course, and our children, and then others. This is wisdom from above, and the woman of the poem demonstrates that she possesses this kind of wisdom. And then in verse 27, he says she is concerned but her first and primary concern is her home and her family. It's not that she isn't concerned with the problems of her society. She helps the poor and so on and so forth, but the concerns of our home are first. When we take care of our own home first, there are usually less problems in the world. One of the reasons there's so many problems in the world is that a lot of people don't take care of their own homes and so other people have to take care of their children and their problems. This woman is aware of the needs of her family and the community, and she's concerned about fulfilling them using all of her skills and qualities refined through the years of service and practice. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 that the man is the head of the woman and consequently the head of the home, yes. But Lemuel, the writer of this material here, balances out this picture by showing us that the woman is the heart of the home. And when the head and the heart are in union with Christ as Lord of the home, what a wonderful place that becomes for whoever lives in that home. And then in verses 28 to 31, the last verses, the author describes the rewards awaiting such a person and the clear signs that this is a virtuous woman. She has this trustworthiness demonstrated by good stewardship of her home and a godly character, and these two things bring her rewards. The first reward is that her own family praises her. He says in verse 28, her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also, and he praises her saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Her children are thankful that they have a mother like her. What a reward for a mother to have grateful children. Her husband sees her as the best of all women. I su this suggests, of course, his absolute fidelity and devotion. And I might say in a personal note, this passage here, Proverbs 31, at Lee's and ours, at our wedding ceremony, this is the passage that I read to her as part of the marriage ceremony. A passage that I read to her because I believed at that time and saw in her many of these qualities here. And I'm happy to say that after nearly 40 years of a happy marriage, uh, all of those things that I believed were true about her are true and continue to be true about her to this day. And so this virtuous woman, her family praises her. And then he says another reward, her community praises her. Her neighbors, her friends and community see her as a woman of value and character. In the end, the author summarizes the true essence of the value of this person by saying, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. And so here the motivating factors, as you see, are not beauty or charm, you know, social acclaim. She's a person that fears, meaning she respects and obeys the Lord. This is what motivates her. Her desire to work well, to serve others, to develop a good character are inspired by her basic faith and desire to obey God 
who wants all of his daughters to become women of value. I want to ask you a question here. I want to see if you've noticed something. Have you noticed the things that were not mentioned in this poem about this woman? Did you notice that nothing was mentioned about her looks? No mention of her skin or her hair, her weight, her height, what kind of figure she had. No, no mention of this at all. No mention of her independence. Not even a question. No mention of her educational level, her achievements in that area. No mention of it. Doesn't mean she didn't have any, it's just, it's not mentioned. These were not mentioned, not because they are not in themselves important, but rather because they did not make her more valuable one way or another. Today, we place so much value on beauty. We place so much value on looks, so much so. Oh yes, we want somebody to be honest, and oh yeah, sure, we'd like them to be kind-hearted, and yeah, it'd be nice if they were you know, uh, good and love. Yeah, those are all good, but, but the number one thing, if you judge by what we look at, what we watch, what we buy, the number one thing is how we look and how we look to other people. But you notice here, nothing is mentioned of any of these things, not a thing. Notice, however, what the Spirit of God through Lemuel actually did mention and consider important. First, her work concerning her responsibility towards her husband and family and community. Today, quote, community, church. Secondly, her attitude of kindness and wisdom. You know, wisdom, a little different than knowledge. Wisdom is the proper application of knowledge and experience. The poem mentions her confidence and her lack of guilt. It's amazing sometimes we have Christians who have been Christians 10, 20, 30 years and, and, and you get to talk to them and the thing that comes out the most is how guilty they feel about things. And yet here he talks about this woman. Doesn't seem that she was doing anything spectacular here. The one thing you do notice is how confident she is for the future, no fear. Her lack of guilt. And he mentions her reward of praise from the three groups that she serves. Her family, her community, and of course God Himself praises her because she serves Him and He is the one that wrote this poem in her honor. You know, we have extremes in recognizing women in our society. Either we have a day that honors only those women that have children, you know, Mother's Day, or the various organizations that promote those women who see themselves as, quote, leaders, social leaders, feminists, whatever. I want to encourage those women who work hard in raising children, but I want to also include all those women who are striving to become women of valor in our society regardless of their status. And who are these women in our day today? Well, they are women who are resisting the pressure from the media and society to work only on the outward beauty, but through patience and obedience to Jesus are creating a beautiful inward person. People only give lip service to the idea that what's important is what's on the inside. That, that they put that in greeting cards that they sell for five dollars for a piece of cardboard and a nice word. You know, we give lip service to that. But the truth of the matter is that God, you ever notice it never says God looks at the skin? It always says God looks at the heart or God knew what he was thinking or God looks at the, the inward man or God looks at the inward things. Why would we not be working and putting all of our efforts into the inward person, knowing full well that the outward person is day by day decaying? 
The hint of that, of the difference of the two natures, is that on the inside, and you know, as I grow older, I see how this is so true. I remember my grandmother saying, when she was about 85 or 86, she said to me, when the springtime comes, my thought is I want to get up and take the bus, she never drove a car, she said, take the bus and the subway and go downtown because I want to buy a new spring dress and new shoes. And then I looked down at these 87 year old legs and realized they won't carry me there anymore. <laughs> what was she saying? She was saying in my spirit I still somehow feel young. It's my body that's old. And I think that when we realize that, we begin to understand this idea of eternal life, this idea of spiritual life that goes on because we simply have to look at our own spirit and that it's always young, it's, it's always kind of at the same place, isn't it? It's always the same age. Oh yes, our souls, our inward man, it gets wiser, hopefully more pious with age, but somehow it always stays the kind of the same age. It's the body that's getting old. Doesn't that teach us that we ought to then be working on that inward person that never grows old, that has been designed to live on after this carcass you know, is done with? I want to encourage the women who in a thousand ways every single day serve their husbands or their families or the church or school or community and they do it with a smile and with sincerity and with diligence. Those are the women I want to honor. Women whose strongest desire is not to be free and independent but rather desire to be useful and kind and generous to those who are in need. Women who are keeping themselves pure and ready for the return of Jesus Christ. Those are the women that I want to encourage. Those are the women that I salute. We have many such women in our congregation and our young men should take careful note of this lesson and review it seriously because I think many times their criteria for finding wives is based more on worldly ideas hatched in Hollywood than godly ones found in the scripture. And so for these women, whether they are married or widowed or single, with or without children, I pray that God will bless you as true women of valor. I also pray that as the precious jewels that you are, you will shine forth among all others and receive the reward of praise that you so richly deserve from your families, from your spouse, from your community, from your friends, from your church family, and of course, from God Himself. So for those women who want to become the virtuous women spoken of here, obviously the first step is to give yourself to Christ in repentance and baptism, and in so doing become pure again, no matter what you've done, you become pure again and special in God's sight. I remember many years ago in Montreal, a young woman became a Christian, new Christian, <clears throat> and then she was to be married. And she came to me and said, you know, I'm getting married. She was marrying a young Christian man. And she felt conflicted because she had had a child out of you know, wedlock. She had had an abortion. She had, you know, she had led a very worldly life, impure sexually. And she wanted to no, if she could wear a white wedding dress and felt conflicted about the idea, knowing who she was and what she had done, was it okay if she wore a white dress to her wedding? And I reminded her that on the day that she was baptized, 
the blood of Jesus Christ washed away all of her sins and she was renewed, pure, virginal in the eyes of God. And I say when you walk down the aisle in that white dress, know that your future husband will be delighted and God will be blessing you as his daughter, pure, sinless, joyful, a young woman of valor. If you need to put on that white wedding dress to be a bride of Christ, then we encourage you always to do that. And if you've gone away from the Lord and not been the kind of woman that God wants you to be, then I say the same thing to you as I would say to any of the brothers, repent and return to Him who loves you and is ready to forgive you. And for anyone else that may need the prayers of the church, we are ready to do that. The elders are here ready to minister to you in any way you may need. So we encourage you to come forward now as Johnny leads us in the song of invitation. Brother John.